And if, if you have questions, just keep on or just type them already in the chat. Um, I have only a few points that uh, occurred in the last week. Um, and all of those had to do with people asking questions about pointers. Um, and I understand that this is a really hard topic. Um, and I expect that um, you will understand what a pointer does. So therefore, it's really important that uh, what I'm going to tell you next or what I'm going to show you next, I hope this will work, um, is, somehow, um, is somehow helpful for you. Normally, I would do this on the blackboard or whiteboard. But um, it is easier, I think, if I do this here on a piece of paper. And for that, I have my phone that I should be able to start. There we go. I just need to pin this video, I suppose. Um, or spotlight, not entirely sure. OK, can everyone see this? This is, of course, not that great in terms of um, image quality. Um, I'll send the, the pictures that, are, that I'll make uh, later, but I think this should be fine. So everyone can see this piece of paper now. Yes, good. OK, perfect. Thank you for the, the feedback. So it's um, not the best. I, uh, well, I tried on my whiteboard. This is even worse. Uh, you'll get to see my gigantic hands now and then. But ideally, um, um, I think it is uh, nice to do this on a piece of paper, because then um, you can abstract a lot more of what happens in memory. So we've seen already in the slides that, there, that memory is divided in four pieces of memory. Uh, on the one hand, you have the program that you have. This is somewhere in memory. Then you have um, stack. Then you have the heap. And then you have uh, whatever is static. Now, we're going to abstract from that. And we're going to see what can be done. Let me, check, let me try it first to turn off the light here, because I don't want anyone to get an epileptic shock here. There. I think that's better. OK. Um, so um, if we have memory, so basically let's um, divide our sheet of paper into our program that we put over here, and it will make readable. So we'll put it in C++ code, and we have our memory over here. And we're going to assume that we have a very simplistic memory where the addresses um, are per byte. So for every address cell that we have, that we can allocate, we have there um, one byte or otherwise also um, eight bits. And they have an address. So we'll have here address zero. The next cell will have address one, uh, then address two, et cetera. Um, and if we have eight bits um, per cell, or we have, for instance, um, um, an addressing that is uh, taking one byte, we would uh, all the way end up to uh, address number 255. And this is, this is um, if we have an address that is one byte long. Right? That's what we're going to assume now. This, is, um, this was true, perhaps, for, a ver for very, very first computers. But from now, these are much longer. But let's assume that one address is basically one byte. Now, somewhere in memory, we will reserve, whenever we have a variable, we will reserve a piece of memory. So if we have a character, that's the easiest. A Boolean is, is uh, the same, in fact, but if we have a character, let's call that ch, then somewhere in memory, we reserve a piece of memory that uh, we reserve for a character. So let's say over here, let's say this is at um, memory piece, uh, memory uh, address 8, we'll reserve a character. Uh, let's use some color here. So in this case, we know that we have um, a variable called character. And this is of uh, type character. Uh, or we have a variable called ch. This is of type character, and therefore we only need one byte. Uh, and this eventually is basically um, getting a value. It has already a value if we would just do this. You know, then I would get a value that the memory was uh, previously holding. So this is just basically eight uh, bits. Um, but we could also give it a value. And for a character, we can uh, give it uh, in C exactly um, something like, for instance, this. Now, this is the first difficult part in C, in C++. This character where we use the single quotes means that we have somewhere a table where we have characters like um, a, 
a B or a zero like here or an exclamation mark, those are actually representations that we have somewhere in a table called the ASCII table where we have from zero to 255 because it's eight bit long, um, a mapping of what every character that we can have um, maps to in terms of a number. Um, I know it's a little bit hard, but let's, for instance, say here we actually do this. We have our zero. Now, a zero would be exactly the same as having uh, this assignment over here. So we could say this is 48, because the zero in single quotations is not an actual zero. It's not zero, 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 zero in binary, but it's actually 48. Um, and if you turn that into binary, you'll have. Zero zero one one zero 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 zero. So this is the actual representation of the character being in quotes zero or forty eight. That's both the same, exactly the same. So basically, over here, um, when we have our our values here, so this is exactly the same. We would have here um, the character zero holding are being held in the piece of memory. And in the background, or on the lowest level in the machine, we have actually four bits here that take a value of 0 and 1. So for the, the character 0, we have actually the number 48 here being represented. And this is basically the binary representation 00110000. That's on the lowest level what will happen there. Okay, so if we now go and to go for other types, we know that they can hold different number of bytes. So not always one byte, like here for our character. Um, but let's now go for an unsigned int. Uh, or an unsigned short int is even better because then I don't have to create many bytes. And we call it, for instance, bar or variable. Now, what happens there is exactly the same. So what we'll have there is somewhere in memory, for instance here, um, two bytes will be reserved because we've seen that a short integer is taking two bytes. And we'll put it unsigned so that we know that um, if we have here eight zeros and here eight zero zeros in binary, um, or a zero in total, that, um, that all of them are zeros. If we would have signed, then we would have the first bit um, uh, depicting either minus or plus. But that, that is um, too much of a detail, I think, for now. To so say we have our variable, um, our variable var, this will basically appear here. Let's also do that in a different color. So we have our var, and we know because it's an unsigned short integer, that we can interpret those um, 16 bits here in a particular way. Right? So, and it takes two, um, two bytes. And also that has a, somehow a memory address. So for instance, 37, and we know that we have then two bytes, so therefore 38 are basically the memory addresses that are taken up by our variable var of type unsigned short hints. And at this point in our program, these things are can be, holding, uh, can be holding random numbers. Right? So if you then give var um, a value, say var equals, shall we say, um, a very easy one, 255, for instance, then we'll know that uh, well, 255 is the highest number you can get for an 8-bit number. So all of those here will be ones. So eight ones over here, and all of those here will be zeros on the lowest level, right? So this is what happens um, when you have a binary representation of the number 255. Let's also put it in green, in fact, that it's easier to understand, I think. So 255 is now the value of our variable var. Okay, so now we get pointers. So when pointers come in, um, we have to first define a pointer. Um, and we'll do it for var, so we'll have exactly the same type as our variable. So we have also here an unsigned short int, and then because it's a pointer, we always have the star, and then we'll have our variable name, for instance, pointer. Now what happens then in our memory is that somewhere in our memory, let's do, well, let's put it over here, 
and is also somewhere having an address, one byte is being reserved for our pointer. And we call this, so basically one byte is being reserved for our pointer. And um, this pointer is basically uh, of type unsigned short int, which means that we uh, know that it will point to something that is pointing to, that is um, reserved or reserving in memory two bytes. Okay, so at the moment, we have here eight bits over here that could be anything. And this is what, our, what we called in the slides or in the videos, dangling pointer. So in, in this case, this could be any sequence of zero and ones, eight zero and ones. So this pointer could point to anywhere into memory. Um, which could be your own program, it could be your other variables, and that is extremely dangerous, of course. So that's why we usually point it at a null pointer, which is kind of a reserved number um, or, or a piece of memory that we don't use. And that we say basically this is um, a safe piece of memory um, that uh, pointers can always point to. Now, if you want to assign um, this pointer uh, or we want to point, make this point to, um, to this variable over here, called var, then we've seen in the slides that all we have to say is pointer is the uh, assigns the reference of var, or basically the address of var. So what happens in the lowest level is that the pointer is then getting the address of our variable var over here. And our variable var is at address 37, so in this simplified model, what you would have is then that the binary representation for 37 is then given to our pointer. So it would be, for instance, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, oh, no, I forgot a 0 here. Yeah, exactly. So this is the binary representation of 37. So we could say this is actually 37 over here. And this is what actually we do here. So this is pointing to the address of our variable var. Okay, so this is this is um, what a pointer then does, and this is what we'll what we we'll get. Now, if then afterwards we say, for instance, um, we want with our pointer to change the, ver the the value over here, we have to dereference our pointer with this star sign. And if we then want to give it a different va a value, um, for instance, two fifty four, that is also an easy one. Um, then what will happen here is that this value over here, so this one will be turned into a zero, and this 55 will be turned to a 54. And so, so with our pointer, we can change pieces of memory without having them, um, without having to define them as we have it here in our variable. So this is the first part, I think, and this is the most important part. If you understand this, then I think um, um, all the problems that come with understanding of pointers and later also references will be somehow moot or will be somehow a lot easier to understand. And so this is, this is the first part. Now, uh, we could do exactly this also for arrays. Um, and for arrays, we'll have to, well, we can actually change this into an array of two, for instance. What happens then, so let me um, block out this. So we have only these two lines over here. What we know in that case is that in that case, um, well, like this, we have four bytes reserved. So two times two bytes, because we have two times an unsigned short integer. And a short integer is basically two bytes. Oops, not that. So basically, um, we know that we automatically then have um, two elements, var with index zero and var with index one. And also var one is basically containing at this point uh, zeros and ones over here. So some type of value. Right, so if we want to give that uh, a, a value over here, we've seen, then we have to index it, so var zero in that case is having that. Okay, this is becoming a little bit unreadable, but I hope you, you get what I'm trying to say here. Um, and um, var one, we can also give a value. For instance, if we give it, uh, say, zero, um, then all of those things over here will all be zeros. 
because we know that the representation of a short int works this way. And then we have a zero right over here. Right, so this is, this is basically all that array does. Um, now, the thing that will happen then is when we use a pointer to our array, um, just like we did it here, we can keep things. The only thing that is changing, however, is that an array over here, by changing this variable to an array, um, we don't need to reference bar anymore. So we can basically just scratch this out and say that the pointer is assigned var, because var is basically then um, the pointer itself to the first elements of our array. So what happens then over here is exactly, until here is exactly what is happening here. So we can actually do this, and we know then that if we do this, we can also change uh, the first element of var. So everything else is exactly the same. So if you understand this, you understood, I would say, 95% of what you need to understand about pointers. Now, one level of difficulty higher is that you can do this with pointers, um, and you can also increase the pointers as such. So if you say, um, we basically increment our pointer. So we say pointer plus 1 equals 1, for instance. Then what will happen is it will exactly point to the next part. You know, so this over here is pointing to the first element of var. This over here is pointing to the second element of var. You can do this. And basically, what will happen then is that the 0 over here is switched to 1. And this uh, var over here is then getting the value 1. OK? So um, this allows you, with a pointer, to go somewhere in memory and also iterate in memory between different elements of an array. Later, we'll see there are nicer ways of dealing with this. You could actually also treat this as an array later on. Um, but this also, I think, points to the fact that it's really hard or really difficult, no, really dangerous um, to use pointers. Because with a pointer, you can go to anywhere in memory. Um, and if you do this for a particular type, so this would definitely be something that you could also try out yourself um, on, the, on the server. You'll see that it will work. You'll see that um, it is as simple as that. You can actually then move between memory pieces of a reserved array. If you go beyond this array and this array has a certain size, then your compiler will probably give you an error. Um, however, and we'll see that later also, or in the slides that will be published today, that you can actually des describe also arrays dynamically. You can say an array is having a variable size, and you can resize those things at runtime. And what will happen then is that with those pointers, you can point almost anywhere in memory without a compiler really checking for all cases. And this is what then leads generally to lots of problems, the most important one being a memory leak or being able to access memory that was never reserved for your program. OK, and exactly the same can also be done for, um, uh, for instance, a piece of code of uh, a class. So a class is nothing else but a, like an array. If we then say we define a class like we had in the slides of type cat, and the simplest implementation I think we had in the beginning was what, that a cat had for instance, um, two integers or an integer and a short integer, then somewhere in memory, our integer would have would be reserved over here, for instance. And that would be uh, four. So this would be, um, I think, I'm not entirely sure any word, but that would be, for instance, our cat.h, for instance. Um, and then so we know that this is four bytes. And then directly attached, for instance, we would have um, cat dot wait. Okay, now I'm getting a little bit sloppy here. But basically, our cat is, in that case, holding this entire piece of memory right here. Um, if we would have um, an instance of type cat, so okay, uh, let me section this over here. So we would have our class cat, where we have um, everything public. 
and we have, for instance, here an integer age and who, okay, let's call that a character weight because we reserved one byte for that. So that is our, our class. And then in the instance, we basically said that we have here um, a variable that we call cats of type cats. So what happens then is that this uh, piece over here is reserved, right? So, and also this is somewhere in memory and we know that uh, these pieces over here refer to these pieces over here. So the first level of difficulty was we just have one variable and a pointer pointing to that variable. The second level of difficulty was we have an array of those variables and a pointer pointing there. Um, and the third one was we have somewhere a class, which is exactly or in a way exactly the same as an array, except that the class has uh, more diverse variables or can have more di diverse variables and could also have actually here functions that um, uh, are attached to this class. And these functions are basically pointers to another PC memory that holds um, hold all the information that is necessary for those for, uh, functions. But I think that would be a little bit going too far. But I mean, if you have understand these concepts, I think then, I, um, then you probably uh, have understand everything there is to know about chapter seven. Okay, any questions about this so far? Um, I have a question about uh, pointers. Yes. Um, when you say that uh, you could access of that piece of, mem uh, piece of memory in any place, could be if you want to access in a, in a small scope and also in the main function. Uh, I don't know if I explained clearly that you could uh, insert or move that pointer uh, also in private uh, scopes or in private uh, functions? Mm -hmm. I don't know, yes. is, yeah? Yeah, so, so this is basically depending on, on your compiler. Um, so in, a, in essence, I would, no, not, not just the compiler. So the compiler will, will be able to warn you if you try to access anything over here that is not reserved in your code over here. So what the compiler does, Essential is it will take all these codes and generate um, out of that machine code that is placed in memory, just like all of these. Um, and before it does that, it can actually check for uh, typical errors. The fact that you, for instance, have uh, or that you are given a piece of memory, um, it can it easily detect then whether you're inside that piece of memory that, you're, that is given to you or outside. And the same for your variables, the same for scopes, as you've said. So depending on whether you are in a particular function um, or whether you're in a particular page, they call this also. Um, I mean, all of these levels can be uh, checked up or checked by our, um, our compiler. So before even our program is compiled, our, our compiler does sanity checks to make sure that we're not aiming this point at, um, at silly locations where we can do a lot of damage. So that is the first thing that is happening. The second thing is that our operating system will also do that. You know, this is exactly what you will get when your core is dumped. You know, when, uh, and many of you had, had that meanwhile um, for the last exercises. So if you have a core dump, then what, you, what, what, what that means is you try to reserve a piece of memory that did not belong to your program or the part in your program in which you were active. Um, and I think this is the level of, of detail that I'm going to give here because anything else would be um, uh, would, would go too far. But basically, those two levels, for instance, um, your operating system and your uh, compiler will already check for lots of things and it will generate errors if you do things wrong. But, and this is the conceptual part here, if you have a problem uh, or if you do actually, uh, for instance, one of the things that I stressed at uh, uh, chapter seven already is that you, for instance, um, delete things, uh, or you should delete things when you create them with the new keywords. Um, if you're uh, not careful there, you could actually delete things that were never created, or you could delete things twice. And in, in certain circumstances, it's really difficult for an interpreter and an operating system to check for that. Um, and this really depends on your operating system, 
uh, it also depends on your uh, your compiler, which compiler you're using. But all of those things are important, and all of those things um, in in general can lead to problems. Um, so this really depends on on uh, on a lot of conditions. But and this is the most important part. If conceptually your program is always following a certain set of rules, like we're trying to teach you, then um, then you will never have this problem. I mean, if you have an array and you're never running out of bounds of this array, if you notice array is always two elements over here and you will never give it an index that is higher than one and never lower than zero, then it, you're fine, basically. This is uh, what happens. And it could be that there are compilers that start giving an, uh, that don't give an error when you try to access var2, for instance, in this case. Um, or there are situations where via pointers, this is very hard predict, to predict, to predict um, by an operating system or a compiler. And therefore, you will not get errors that protect um, your system from such things. And that will lead uh, to all those errors that we might have in software later on. OK, did that under, uh, answer your question? Yeah, 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 thank you. OK, perfect. Um, OK, then an exam question that is uh, typical for this, uh, I think I gave last time. So look at the video from last time. Um, I will probably combine, I, I will always have a question where I try to see whether you can predict what happens, for instance, if I do these type of things with pointers. I will add to that um, references that we will see in the video that will be uploaded today. And uh, you need to predict what the value will be that will be outputted then if I read a certain thing afterwards. So the, the exercise that I gave you, or that I um, gave us, I think, exam uh, 05 uh, in the Moodle and also in this video, I think is a very good example there. And I tend to combine this with, for instance, um, functions or passing parameters um, uh, for functions where the parameters can be normal parameters or can be normal you know, integer, for instance, but the parameter can be also a pointer. And the difference then by passing uh, by reference or passing by value, um, and the value is copied, basically then I think is what you need to understand there as well. And those are you know, usually the questions that I give there. OK, so um, when we create an object from a class, in this case, internally, the compiler is making a pointer? Yes. And this is something um, uh, that we haven't seen yet, but um, this is, I think, coming as well, yes. Um, so we have the this pointer for a class. But this is coming uh, in the next chapter. So um, in our class, uh, cat, for instance, we can over here in our functions, we have this uh, pointer called this, T-H-I-S, um, which we can always have. So as soon as we have this cat over here, and we, for instance, want to define a function or a constructor, we can, for instance, say um, this pointer, so minus sign to bigger than sign, um, and then H uh, equals two, for instance. So this is one way um, or one thing we can have. OK, the next question. Can you explain the calculator example given in the text? Um, yes, but doing this now, I think, would be a little bit hard. Um, let me go to the slides. Or can you uh, be a bit more specific and to see what is the, what is the problem? Because I think, um, I mean, so the calculator example is given as a whole. So you could actually copy that and, and try it out for yourself. Um, so I think my question or my question back is, um, what is the, the hard part about the, 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 the calculator? And if you have more questions, then please ask, because I, I think I ran out of questions here in the chat window.
Any more questions? Ah, okay. Um, another question is about the exam. What are we, uh, or what can we bring? Um, I mean, so I think I, I also put this in the Moodle uh, message. So what you're allowed to bring is uh, something to write with, and this can't be a pencil, so it needs to be ink that doesn't wipe out, and it is preferably uh, black or very dark. So basically black or um, or blue, I think I wrote. Um, but um, that is the most important. Your student ID I also will need, um, and um, the rest I'm I'm still clearing. So I understand this question because for exams. Uh, you probably will need to bring a mask uh, in these times. Um, you can bring something to drink, of course. Um, but I think that is about it. Oh, and of course, the, for the um, in terms of material, you can write. You can bring one A4 page where you can write or print something on both sides. This is to make sure that you keep it very simple. Um, in the past or a while ago. I allowed everyone to bring the entire syllabus or the whatever they want, also books or whatever. This, in my experience, is not helping. So if you can't concisely uh, put everything that, um, you know, things like this over here, for instance, on one page or two sides of a page, I think um, it, it doesn't matter then. Then it will take too long for you to look up certain things and it won't help you um, in your programming assignments that you get for the exam. So, um, and also with related to this, I would really encourage you to try out all the examples again that I gave you either in these videos or also in the lecture um, and the exercises, of course, because all of those are very relevant. If you can do those things on paper or at least parts of those things, because I will never ask you a really long example. I will ask you something where you need to fill in you know, 12 lines of code max, I would say. And I would give you all the lines that are trivial, that I would call trivial. And I think I, I explained that also in these um, videos. So I think that is the most important, that you can actually immediately code on paper without having to try out things by using a compiler or seeing whether it uh, gives an error or not. And also nicely structured, of course. So I'm still baffled by some of you, only a few of you, but still that don't indent their codes or have a very strange way of structuring the code. So please make sure that you also keep to that. And, um, I've seen that many of you or all of you, almost all of you, um, have now, now very nice structure in, way, in the way you code and also the way you add uh, comments. So, I'm, uh, so I hope that everybody will do this also on the exam. Oh, and then a very nice um, question he indeed that I wanted to have on my list anyway is how many chapters, lectures um, will we have more? So I will today upload a video um, and next week I will upload another two videos, I would say. But um, in essence, there is not that much anymore. So there's, I think, uh, only two lectures. So there will be only one lecture this week, one lecture next week. And what you have to know is almost all seen already. So unfortunately, the semester or the term this time was very short. Um, so I kind of ran out of time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to know less than the last years. In fact, we will see more or less the same. Um, I will again repeat what you really have to know uh, uh, next week. But essentially, uh, from chapter 7, you will need to know all of these things over here, plus references. This is only a, single, uh, a little bit of an add-on. And for the next chapter, um, only the part of inheritance, of how to inherit a class, is what you have to know there. Um, we'll go much further in the syllabus, all that you won't have to know. So um, the syllabus is going all the way to STL, um, or polymorphism, for instance. All of those things I will probably quickly explain in a very high-level fashion, so that you at least have seen those. But you don't have to know it for the exam, or you don't have to implement or be able to implement codes uh, in that regard. Okay, then I need to scroll up again, I think, because ah, I hear a question about, so if, uh, can I initialize a character type array like this? Uh, so for instance, C0 equals that. 
Um, yes, you can, exactly. Um, so the question is if you have a character array in that case, so it needs to be of type car, but if you then immediately initialize the first character of your array to, um, to the zero or to zero as a number or to between quotes slash zero, um, then you basically have a way of saying this is an empty string. Because if you um, handle then in all the rest of your code this as a string and you basically stop whenever you uh, see this uh, slash zero or escape character zero, then you know that, um, that this string is now ended and you hit the limiter and you don't have to look for all the other characters in your string. So this is uh, a definite yes as an answer there. Then uh, the calculator example. So the next question or a follow-up question is there that you face some issues in compiling the codes. Um, no, and then the question is, is this calculator in the lecture a class? Um, no. Uh, so basically in the calculator example, we first see how you can modularize your code. So this is kind of as a preface to uh, what we'll see as a class, of course. So we've seen also structs as a follow-up of class. Um, and then we've said we never use struct again, we'll just use class as we've seen here in this uh, cat, cat example, for instance. Um, we've also seen the, the, the calculator example for our namespace example. So there we declare the namespace calculator. And this is basically saying all of the things that we're going to define from now on, um, and this basically uh, a set of functions, we'll call also all the, of this uh, part of the same namespace. Um, essentially, the namespace is something that is handled by the compiler, um, but that is, other than that, not important for you, really. Um, and that's also why um, for the namespace uh, standard or STD, for instance, I've, I will never ask you this for the exam. I will give this already in the codes so that you can use C in and C out or end line as things you can just use in the code, but I don't want you to learn this part by heart because I think this is not one of the most valuable things in C++ that you might have difficulty with or that um, is a little bit harder. And I think this is just a part of the language, uh, but conceptually I think it is not something that um, many of you will have problems with. We've seen lots of other things in C and C++ that are part of the language, uh, but also that I think is not the most important. So um, for the, the calculator example, we've seen this because there we've seen for the first time header guards, um, age and CPP files that basically split up uh, separation of concerns. So in the, in the header file, we basically declare a function uh, or we define it by just saying this is our contract, this is what we will do in this function, and the actual implementation of our functions in the CPP file, for instance. So that is the reason why we've seen this calculator example. Um, and we could have done this also completely without the namespace, by the way. So um, the namespace is an add-on so that we know that all of that, what we um, all, all of that what we de declare, so those functions we've declared, that those somehow belong together. Um, another way could have been that instead of saying this all belongs to a namespace, we could have, uh, for instance, all started these functions with calculator underscore and then the name of the function. So for instance, we would have calculator underscore calculate as a function or calculator underscore read operands. This is, would have been exactly the same in a way. Okay. Um, the pattern of the header file is different. I'm not entirely sure what that means. So there is a calculator.h file, there is a calculator.cpp file, and there is the calculator uh, or calc main.cpp file. So my question back to you is what do you mean with pattern? of the header file. Maybe there's a mistake in the, in the slides, so uh, I definitely, oh, definitely could be. Okay, another question to me privately was, uh, someone started with this 20 second video, can I relate pointer concept with the swap function we used before? 
Ah, okay. So this is something that is definitely important also for the exam also, I would say. Um, and that was also, I mean, there I would also look at the, uh, the video from two weeks ago, I believe, um, where I actually implemented the swap function. So if you, I mean, I think by seeing also what a pointer really is, or the way on the lowest level the pointer works, if you give a pointer as a parameter to a function, what you will do is actually, you will um, give something that points to another piece of memory, and if the function then has this over here and then can follow whatever is then following somewhere else, we know that if the function then can change this and then return, that this will be left changed after you exit the function. I think this is the main uh, reason why I show this swap function. And this is the passing by reference uh, part. Um, and this is, I think, the, 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 the most important. Okay, then back to the calculator. Is this a case of inheritance? No. Um, so the calculator part is, has nothing to do with object-oriented programming. It is basically saying we have a couple of functions that belong together, and therefore we use this namespace. And they belong together, therefore we put them in the same header file and the same CPP file. And in uh, calc main, you basically then include calculator.h so that you can have kind of a library of functions that you could use all the way together. So it's kind of the way you split things up into files. But this is, at this point, not C++. This is completely C in a way, apart from the, the namespace, perhaps. But um, in a way, this is um, everything. We, I mean, this is not using a class. Um, and I would also not look at the calculator example as, um, as an example of how to do it, because later uh, uh, the calculator example will be implemented as a class, or should be implemented as a class. Uh, the next question is, are we going to get another assignment after the one with the hangman game? So that's the current one. Uh, no, this is it. So we debated also this amongst uh, uh, your tutors. Um, the problem is that um, if we would have to give another exam, another exercise, or another set of assignments, then the problem would have been that um, you would have um, to continue working as you were beyond the lecture period, and many of you already have exams straight after this one, so straight after the week after the next. So that would mean that you would have to um, fill assignments and at the same time um, do everything else. Uh, so this would be, I think, a bit too hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to then finalize this. We won't have um, a presentation phase as we would have it uh, in previous years where you would present to us your codes. Instead, the, um, the points that you assemble are half of the points. So at the moment, those are 40 points in total with two bonus points for the first or the zero to the assignment. And that will then be half of the points. The other half will be as still as promised uh, for the exam. Okay, so the, the answer is that's it. So after this assignment, this will be it um, in terms of assignments. Then can you give us some training exams to get a feeling of how much time we need for each question? Um, that is a little bit hard, although I'm pretty sure that uh, people in the past have already looked at my exams. That's also the reason why I change my exams all the time. Um, but in essence, I will have about um, so three or four, I would say four or five questions that are very small and where you have to implement small pieces of code. Um, Whereas the hardest parts or the hardest questions are the ones that I've seen in the previous videos, in the Q&A videos. For instance, this uh, drawing a Z um, or drawing an X or something like that is, I would say, a hard part. And that would be like one gigantic question. And there would be then two, three other questions that are smaller in scale, where you just have to implement uh, smaller parts of a function, for instance, in a particular way. And what I will then ask, in essence, is you to uh, implement a loop, a loop with, um, with a switch or an if-then statement to get a basic algorithm going. 
Um, and uh, there will always be a question about exactly this. So to see whether you can, you have your, your conceptual model of what is a memory in C and C++ and how pointers work. That will also definitely be one of the, one of the cases. And another uh, question will be about how a class is defined. And um, that is, I think, the one where you really have to know, for instance, what constructors can do or what a constructor is for at all, and um, how to implement that. So the fact that you then have to, for a given class, implement functions that belong to that class, and that you know, for instance, what public and private might mean in that case. So this is also an, a question that appears again and again and again. So those are, I think, the general concept because the, after all, this is an introduction to programming session. Um, I think I, I put lots of value of you single-handedly um, solving a little problem. Um, and for, that, for those little problems, uh, you have to really um, be in control of these type of concepts. So I think this is the hardest part. Um, it's not about learning by heart the fact that, um, that you have something like namespace, for instance, that is not the aim. The aim is really about the understanding part. That's also why you, know, you can actually take uh, this A4 site with you. So I would all um, advise you to put something like this, like a small example, or put, for instance, the syntax of a class, how to, um, how to define it. Uh, a uh, class implemented or a function implemented in a class, you know, the fact that you have then the class name with the double uh, columns and then the function name, etc. All of those things are then, for me, less important. Um, and if you put those on your uh, A4 page, you should easily then be able to write um, how things are, are working. <clears throat> the fact that you have a function with a return type, for instance, with certain parameters, how that works is very important. Okay, then the next question is, what is the criteria for the check of the first new exercise? Um, ah, my code seems to work fine when I tested it, and it gives me the right outputs, but check says that it does not work. Okay, there I have to um, quickly uh, refresh my uh, understanding of the new exercise, of the latest exercise. So, bare moments. Um, <clears throat> so this is exercise five, right? Um, let me check also what the exercise does there. Okay, I'm now in my check uh, program and just checking exactly what I'm looking for uh, or what uh, we're going to test. Um, uh, I see. So basically what I'm uh, testing for is I'm giving a string um, and the string is always the same. That's why I'm not going to give you that string. But the string has certain characters that are uh, being presented and I'm making sure that what comes back after the string is exactly what I expect. So, um, so what, what a check does, it will basically just send a string or basically input a string to your program. It first compiles your program, then executes the program, then we'll send it a string, and the string has a certain number of characters and is conform with how the exercise is written. And then it basically tests whether what, it, what your program returns is exactly the way it's, uh, or what it's supposed to be. Now make sure that you really read the question very well. Um, typical things that uh, people had so far is that, for instance, instead of minus signs, they put underscores or equal signs um, for the hidden characters. Make sure that you don't do that, that you really look at um, 
what we're supposed to do in that case, you basically should um, remove the character and replace those with a minus sign, for instance. Um, so if your code works, or if you think your code works, make sure that you look also for these very small nitpicking. I totally acknowledge that this is you no know, nitpicking if uh, then the check says that this is not right. Conceptually, it works, but because um, it's then a minus sign, or it's not a minus sign that we're then looking for, uh, you get an error there, but um, make sure that uh, you really look at all the details of the assignment. I think um, I tried out all the things, and I, I've seen that uh, some, many people have already uh, solved that one. Make sure you look at all the details of the assignments. If you still have problems, as before, after you know, trying as many times, just send me an email if you have uh, more questions there. Okay. Then, will you be subtracting points if, for, uh, for example, writing size of versus size of? Um, I assume this is for the exam, right? So uh, in that case, um, I have to confess, your handwriting is sometimes really nice, but also not in other cases, not that nice. <laughs> so whether this is a capital O or not, for instance, for this example, if you, um, if you have to write, uh, write size off, I won't probably be able to see this. Um, so I will, for those type of things, give you the benefit of the doubts. Um, also whether um, a dot, for instance, if you have a member function for a class, for instance here for cats, and you have then cat dots, or for one of the variables, for instance, sometimes our dots look like commas or whatever, but I'm not going to do um, that level of um, critical analysis. Um, then another question uh, privately to me is about uh, registering for the exam in Zono. I'm aware that there are some, especially from the mechatronic students, some, uh, but no, actually all students, um, there are some problems there. Um, the, I, all I can say is there that the examination office is on it and they will leave um, the um, the registration for the exam open until 24 hours before the exam actually happens. That means don't panic, you have still time to register for the exam, although I would um, suggest to do this as soon as possible. So the sooner, the, the, the nicer for me, because then I know how many things I have to print out. Um, but the period did not pass yet. So basically in the Unizono system, I think the deadline was somehow April. But don't worry about it, that is not the case. So you will be given until August for sure um, to register for the exam. Um, and the fact that they asked me, you know, it's, it's basically I will pass it back to them, but I know that um, um, Mrs. Berg from the examination office is on it. So, the, so try again in a few days, I would say, because then I think you, know, you should be able to register in Unizono. The next question is, can you explain inheritance of a class? Um, that will be seen um, in a video that I will upload tomorrow. Uh, and this is kind of a shortcut to the next uh, chapter. And I'm aware that this is necessary for the last assignment. Um, so I will actually, tomorrow in this video, show exactly what is necessary. Um, the concept itself is actually fairly simple. Uh, some of you already have easily uh, solved this. I think even last week, some even. Um, but I think that's, um, I mean, the, the, the thing that will be necessary for explaining this will be then given um, by tomorrow or tomorrow itself. Um, the next question, can you tell us how check identifies the actual output uh, between the rest of the texts? Um, it does this by string matching. So basically it will look at what you're giving back. It will ignore everything else, it will look for a substring that is the right string. So if you print things before that or after that, it will ignore that. But the actual string that it looks for is, if, if that is in exactly matched, then it will check uh, or it will return OK. This is, I mean, this is another reason. So basically, if um, your string has spaces between the characters, that's another common thing that's, uh, that has happened. Uh, also there, the check command does not say OK, because um, in the example or in the assignment, you basically have, um, for all the hidden characters, you have minus, 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 for instance. 
Ok. Um, if we finish homework late, will I get points for that? Depends. So up until now, I have allowed people to finish late for a very good reason. So if you will finish later, then please tell me so. And then we will um, uh, still look at your um, exercises. If not, um, then we might miss your exercises and put a zero there. So this is really on a per person basis and this is on an exception uh, basis, I would say. So you will have to email me um, if that is the case. If you, for some reason you have missed a deadline or you think you will miss a deadline. Okay, some people say that they were able to register now for the exam. So maybe it is already um, for all um, um, all directions, so basically mechatronics or HDI or some other um, study uh, programs, I think it has been opened. I hope it has been opened for now for everyone, but just try it out. Um, if it's uh, not possible, um, by next week, I would say just send me another email. All right, another uh, good question is in the hangman example, can we, um, can we uh, change the function that I asked for? That uh, the answer is no. So if the assignment says we have to implement a function, uh, we have to name it reveal, and it has only this particular um, uh, parameter, namely this uh, character array of size 10, then that is the assignment. That is the limitation for you as a programmer to operate in. Um, I know it would be much nicer to, uh, for instance, give them the size as a second. This is also what, uh, in that case, many uh, uh, programs should do, in fact. But for this assignment, we, uh, we see what happens when you try to implement it as such. Right? So the idea is there that you, since in this case, for Hangman, you need to then make sure that you never go out of bounds for this particular array. Um, and you need to adhere to the assignment and therefore define your function as having this one parameter, it being this um, character array. Okay, any other questions? Ah, another good question. Do we need to write comments on the exam? Um, I would say no, because I, so I, I think um, it's, it's, it's definitely not necessary. Um, so you don't need to write the comments the way you've been writing those for your assignments, or most of you have been writing uh, for your assignments. It could, however, help you in certain cases. Um, so if I have a question about understanding whether you really grasp the concepts and you make a silly mistake, if there is a comment behind that that explains why you do things in a certain way, it is giving me some more information. And um, so I would actually say that in some situations where you, for instance, writing variables in a particular way, in a shortened way, for instance, um, or, or yeah, where, where you want to give me, as a, somebody who then grades your paper, more information, comments are the way to do it. So I would, I would encourage you to write comments here and there, but of course not prosa or not you know, extensively. I think also there are very short, just like um, we've been doing also I think in the lecture and in the exercises, make sure that it's short to the point and divulges uh, exactly the information that you need to divulge. Okay, so I get more positive comments of people saying that they can actually register for the exam. So it looks at both HCI and mechatronics can now uh, register. So that should be okay. okay somebody else said that uh, in the Unizono it's until the 24th of July. So maybe you should actually not wait too long uh, before, um, before actually register. But 
Um, also, there, there's a problem we can actually um, open or keep this open until the end. The exam is 24th of July. No. <laughs> so that is wrong in that case. Um, okay, I'll have to look. I'll have to look how you do so, no? What is happening there? I can see that 40 people have already registered. So that is definitely working. Um, but I can't see when and where in the system. <laughs> um, so, So I can't see in the in the system yet when uh, when this is uh, fixed. But I was told the day that I uh, communicated with you via Moodle. So this should be something that definitely um, I, ah somebody helpfully sent uh, sent me a picture. Uh, boom, boom, boom. But also there, I don't see when the exam is, right? I see how many credit points, I see the periods. But it doesn't say when the exam is. So. But I will basically then um, definitely get back to you. So at, at, at the moment, you know, the exam is as high as it has been communicated to you uh, via Moodle. I would say this is the, the information that I was given. So, uh, and this is then the 25th, yeah, 25th of August. Right? Professor? Yes. Uh, actually, we have a, uh, something for discussion. Uh, our exam in uh, 25 of August, mm -hmm. and in 27 of August, we have another exam. It is the uh, also very, very uh, hard exam, it's sensorics. Mm -hmm. And uh, the few students also want to, uh, for example, postpone the exam date for a late if it is possible. I want to ask you if uh, it will be possible. Can we write to you, students of the Mechatronics, yes, can we write to you some email or examination office about this for postponed the date of the programming uh, exam? Is it Ooh. possible? Um, we will see. I mean, it was very hard work to get this date. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I can't promise anything. Um, but I mean, there are, I know, some other problems. So a few of you are still stuck abroad. This is another thing that I'm trying to fix. So those, uh, I know that some people, a handful, not that many, but a handful of people won't be able to uh, attend the exam then as well. Um, I would say this. I mean, so basically, if you really have problems in attending this exam, you send me an email so I can see how many people this really is. Um, if this is a, um, um, a, a requirement for the mechatronics, then I would say a lot of people have been affected already. Um, but th then I'll have to check in that case. Because on the other hand, we, all, we have like um, different study programs to see as well. So people from uh, human computer interaction, for instance, have probably also um, or might also have collisions there. Um, we will see. Yes, it will be actually great, for example, after uh, 10th of se September, because uh, all of our September is free for exam, 
starting mm -hmm. from the 10th of September, we are free. And actually to move the date of one of the exam to the 10th of the September will be great for us. For preparing, for coming to the exam uh, in the time and so on. It will okay. be great. And all of the students right now is discussing about it and it's more than 50% of the students right now uh, have a problem with the, this uh, slope of the dates, 25 and 27. Because preparing to the bot exam at the same slope, it will be, it, it will, uh, in any way, it will affect the score. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I made a note of it and I will see. I mean, it's still, I mean, uh, postponing it might be possible. Um, another thing that we could do is actually split groups so that we have um, two exams, but then I'll need to be a little bit more creative and have two completely different exams. I'm not sure if that is um, within the limits of what I can do there, but um, we will see that in that case. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I add something to this? Yes. Um, so um, I think it would be then better to have two groups because for some of us the, to have the exam in September would also be not great because some of us are doing internships or have planned a holiday now that we knew that the exam is on the 25th of mm -hmm. August. Yes. So for me personal, it wouldn't be that good to have the exam in September. Okay, good. Um, so, and I think, I think this is probably then the way it will go um, so that I will split it into two groups because I think also there it was such hard work trying to get the Automax and this gym room reserved in August that I think um, I will probably uh, still reserve those or one of those then, and then we'll have definitely then one group um, on that date. And then for those that really have a problem, um, and if it's mechatronic students, I think there's a, probably a hundred people that will meet in a new date at a later uh, time. Okay, and I see more people having no problems with the 25th of August. Um, and other people saying, oh, actually most people do actually agree so far with the 25th of August. Um, but we'll see then uh, how many, and in that case we can probably um, look at feedback from you. Um, so in that case, I'll probably ask in the coming weeks, uh, because this is now um, getting later and later. I mean, remember, ideally, or the uh, idea in the beginning, or the way we've um, done this in previous years was, we just hold this in the last lecture week. Um, we're now uh, end of August instead of uh, middle of uh, July. And to postpone it to September is, for me, not a problem. Um, but I can imagine that for all your planning, uh, this has probably been uh, a disaster. Um, and for me, probably it also would be easier to have then two exams that are a little bit smaller. So I don't have to have 170, 180 people uh, to take care of at the same time. OK, lots of people saying that the 25th is great. Um, but so basically, I, I will actually then probably look for feedback and see uh, when it would be indeed perfect. Um, some people have also uh, then sent me these uh, pictures of what they see in Unizono. Um, and that, I think, is um, also quite important. Um, I think for the HCI students, you probably have then uh, an older stage because the 24th of July is basically the end of the lecture season. I think this uh, needs to be then filled in still. Um, so I will actually look at the examination office uh, or ask the examination office of the third faculty to see whether this is exactly or whether it's, it's they're doing. Um, but rest assured that the date that currently stands is the 25th of August. And then I would uh, say that those that really can make it on the 25th of, of August do it then. Those who would think it would be better to postpone it to September can do it in September. But, and that's another thing, I can't guarantee anything there yet. So we'll have to then reserve rooms again, which is logistically not as easy uh, at the moment. We'll see. But, I mean, this is what we'll try. Okay, anything else? 
hello professor yes i can hear you uh, actually the problem uh, with the exam date is only with mechatronic students so yes. i think the group of mechatronic students exam can be postponed by from your yes. side no this is what i got this is i mean i understand the problem um and I, I, but I, yeah, so I, I need to see how many people are affected um, because the mechatronic students are a big bunch, but you know, the rest is also still quite a big bunch. So the way, I mean, and, and some mechatronic students also might not um, have been assigned or signed up for that exam that is colliding two days later. So we will see. Um, but all, all I can promise at the moment is that we can actually try to um, split this into two groups in that case. Okay, any other questions? Not yet. Uh, so just to wrap up, basically, is that next week we'll have the last Q&A session um, on Thursday as well. Um, and before that, I will make sure to upload all the videos, the lecture videos that will then also tell you what is the scope of the exam. But basically, I've already told you this. So what we've seen now, or what we'll see now in chapter seven, um, and what we see out of chapter eight is basically just inheritance that you need to know. And that's exactly what is also asked in the last question of the current assignments. So basically what you then have in terms of assignments will give you a very good idea of what topics you need to know for the exam. Okay. Right, so there's no more questions that I see. So you have five seconds to open up your microphone and ask me a question. Okay, no more questions. Good, then thank you all for attending. And um, as I said, next week we'll definitely have a Q&A session because it's the last uh, week of the lecture season and by then we will have everything covered and um, then everything should be in the Moodle system for you to study um, and by then I think that's the last chance also that you can actually have direct feedback from us. All right, so thank you very much and we'll see each other next week. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.